descriptions that the media cover. These are videos that are meant to draw attention. And what better way to draw attention than to keep upping the ante? At The Listening Post, we take a story, look at how it's being reported, and then ask why. At this time, on Al Jazeera. with us, I'm Elizabeth Thrawnham in Doha. These are the top stories on Al Jazeera. Polls will open in under an hour in Sudan's general election, but it's being boycotted by many opposition parties. Omar al-Bashir has ruled the country for 26 years. He's the favorite to win the presidential race. Hillary Clinton has launched her bid to become the United States' first female president. The former U.S. Secretary of State is expected to begin campaigning in the state of Iowa on Tuesday. And Saudi Arabia has rejected Iran's demands to stop bombing Yemen. There have been more airstrikes and fighting in northern Yemen. Turkey's Prime Minister Ahmed Davutoglu has criticized Pope Francis after he used the word genocide to describe the killing of Armenians a hundred years ago. Turkey's withdrawn its ambassador to the Vatican, saying the Pope's comments were wrong and inappropriate. Alexi O'Brien reports. <laughs> It was a ceremony of quiet commemoration, marking a hundred years since the killing of Armenians by Ottoman Turks. But it sparked a diplomatic row with Turkey after these words from Pope Francis. In the past century, our human family has lived through three massive and unprecedented tragedies. The first, which is widely considered the first genocide of the 20th century, struck your own Armenian people. Words welcomed by Armenians in the crowd outside, but swiftly condemned by the Turkish government, which has recalled its ambassador to the Vatican in protest. The Pope's statements are a misinterpretation and misreading of history, acknowledging one group's pain and neglecting the others. The timing of this statement is very unfortunate, wrong and inappropriate. It's the word genocide that's contentious. Turkey has long accepted that Armenians were killed by Ottoman Turks in the beginning of the 20th century, but it has consistently denied that the deaths numbered as many as 1.5 million or that it amounted to genocide. There are still strained relations between the two countries, their borders been closed since 1993. The Armenian president says the Pope's comments deliver a powerful message. We're getting messages from all over the world. Armenians all over the world are touched by this message. They consider this hundred years long fight for recognition is still going on, but there are already significant results. Armenia is close to the Vatican's heart. It's regarded as the world's first Christian nation. But its relationship with Turkey is also important. The Pope travelled there last year, a gesture of bridge building with the Muslim world. Turkey typically follows the uh, same pattern. It withdraws the ambassador for consultations, and then after a period of time, a few months, they restore the, uh, they restore the ambassador to the post. Uh, Turkey cannot afford to have a complete rupture of relations with the Vatican, given its importance uh, around the world, given that it's, it speaks for over a billion Catholics around the world. As Armenians prepare to mark the centenary themselves later this month, it's clear the pain of what happened a hundred years ago is still being felt today. Alexi O'Brien, Al Jazeera. Hundreds of thousands of Brazilians have taken to the streets again to protest against government corruption and economic problems. Much of their anger has been focused on President Dilma Rousseff. Alan Fisher reports from Sao Paulo. <laughs> Many groups, many voices, one message, Dilma must go. There were tens of thousands on the streets of Sao Paulo. Many wore the yellow and green of the country's national football team. They marched along one of the city's main streets, stretching for more than two kilometers. They're angry at a struggling economy and a corruption scandal that has implicated politicians from President Dilma Rousseff's party. Anything is better than Dilma, anything. We want anything but Dilma. She will keep uh, her mandate to the end. But it's very important for us to show that we are not happy. We are not happy with the government. 
There were large protests elsewhere across the country, but they were not as large as organisers predicted. Here they numbered in tens, if not hundreds of thousands, and not as large as protests last month. A new survey reveals that 63% of Brazilians would like to see President Dilma Rousseff impeached and removed from office. But that same survey also shows that 29% of Brazilians believe that will happen. The president is touched by a corruption scandal at the state oil firm Petrobras. It's alleged politicians took bribes in return for construction contracts. Most of the politicians belong to the president's workers' party and its allies. Rousseff was chairman, but nothing suggests she did anything wrong. One economist says the president isn't in any immediate danger of losing her job. Huge mistakes were made, but uh, I think that uh, there is no evidence that uh, could lead to the president's impeach impeachment at this moment. Of course, uh, that may appear. The protesters' right to take to the streets has been defended by the president herself. She says she's making changes, but the outrage remains, and there's no sign it's about to go away. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera, Sao Paulo. Nigeria's president-elect, Muhammadu Buhari, has made more gains in regional elections. For the first time since the end of military rule in 1999, his party will control both the presidency and the governorship of Lagos State. With 21 million people, it's the most important state in Nigeria. People living in Kenya's Dadaab refugee camp are asking the government to reconsider its decision to close it. The Kenyan government has given the UN three months to relocate the camp. It's one of the world's largest, sheltering around half a million Somali refugees who'd fled civil war. Mohamed Ado is there. This is Ifo camp in northeast Kenya. It's part of a complex for refugees near the Kenya-Somalia border. 25 years after they were established to accommodate continued existence of these camps now remains in doubt. The Kenyan government wants all refugees relocated within three months. It's a position supported by leaders from northeast Kenya who themselves are ethnic Somalis. Today, our own security forces cannot enter the refugee camp. Gangs are formed. Our Shabaab cells are there. So what we have said is, we have done enough. We want them to relocate, to relocate 30 kilometers on the other side of Somalia. The refugees deny accusations Al-Shabaab cells operate in their camps. Over the years, the Dadaab camps that were initially meant for just 90,000 people have received waves of refugees fleeing conflict and drought, pushing the population in the camps to almost a half a million people. Despite the tough conditions here, most refugees see them as a better alternative to life in Somalia. We met elders from the refugee community in a crisis meeting. Going back to Somalia is not an option for us. Even the leaders of the Somali government are not safe and have to travel in tanks belonging to the peacekeepers. If Kenya is tired of hosting us, then we request the international community to resettle us in a third country. It's not the first time the Kenyan government has called for the repatriation of Somali refugees. An agreement between Kenya, Somalia and the UN has already seen the voluntary return of more than 2,000 refugees in the past year. The latest call by the Kenyan government is its boldest so far. The threat that Kenya will forcefully remove the refugees if the UN doesn't is what has the refugees worried most. They have this warning for the Kenyan authorities. If we are returned against our will, then the thousands of young men among us will join Al-Shabaab. They will have no option but to join the group. It's the only thing that will give them relevance. UN officials say it will be impossible to close the camps and that any move to relocate the refugees must first be agreed upon by Kenyan and Somali authorities. Mohamed Ado Al Jazeera at the Dadaab refugee camps in northern Kenya. There have been violent protests in Gabon on the west coast of Central Africa following the death of a senior opposition leader. Witnesses say opposition supporters set fire to the embassy of Benin while rioting in the... Obame, who died on Sunday. The leader of South Africa's opposition, the Democratic Alliance, says she won't stand for re-election at the party's Congress next month. Helen Zilla says the party needs a new leadership, but she will continue on as the premier of Western Cape Province until 2019. 
Our national parks in South Africa have stepped up security to stop endangered plants from being stolen. It's hoped high-tech surveillance will protect the cycad, which is the world's oldest seed plant. The plants can fetch up to $10,000 on the black market. From Cape Town, Erica Wood reports. In the days the dinosaurs roamed the earth, this is what the landscape might have looked like. Filled with palm-like plants, that were once the dominant vegetation. The cycad has been around for 300 million years, but several species have already disappeared and others are about to follow suit because of the actions of humans in the last few decades. Yes, they've survived several mass extinctions in the world where 70, 80% of everything went extinct. They've stuck around through ice ages and yet there's a really, really good chance that they're going to go extinct because of our activities and mainly because of, of collecting and to a less extent through habitat loss. Two thirds of all cycad species are threatened, making them the most endangered organisms on the planet. They're disappearing because they're being poached to supply wealthy private collectors. Kirsten Bosch Gardens in Cape Town has some of the rarest of the world's cycads, some of which have been growing here for a hundred years, but they're no longer safe. The garden staff have now had to install sophisticated alarms and motion sensors. That's because in August last year, thieves came in during the night and dug out a total of 23 critically endangered cycads. In the wild, there's only 60 of them left. South Africa's top criminal investigation team, the Hawks, has been brought in. But this operation was well planned and executed. Cycads are very slow to reproduce. So the theft has put back years of painstaking work to increase their numbers. We monitor them, we measure them, we see when they cone, their sizes and so on. It feels like one of your children is missing. While the threat to other endangered animals like rhinos and elephants is well publicised and funded, the cycad is largely forgotten. The government doesn't have the resources to properly put a stop to the trade. The situation is quite bleak, unless something drastic is done. After millions of years of surviving catastrophic extinction events, nothing, it seems, is quite as destructive as the actions of humans. Erica Wood, Al Jazeera, Cape Town, South Africa. Chinese media says a former state assets chief has gone on trial accused of bribery and abuse of power. Jiang Jimin was also chairman of PetroChina's state-owned parent company and was the target of a sweeping corruption investigation with several senior figures being detained. Now, parents in Australia who refuse to vaccinate their children may lose benefits. The government's so-called no-jab, no-pay policy could see them miss out on up to $12,000. This is essentially a uh, no jab, no pay policy from this government. It's a very important public health announcement. It's a very important measure to keep our children and our families as safe as possible. A team of scientists in Australia says it's developed a technique that could revolutionise solar power production. Our correspondent Andrew Thomas reports from Newcastle. It looks almost like an act of worship, but this is science. Mirrored panels known as heliostats turn in unison towards a tower. They direct onto it a powerful glow sunlight. This could revolutionise the way the sun creates electricity. It's the latest frontier for solar power. Really these types of projects are really uh, where you can push the boundaries a little but also demonstrate exactly what the potential of the technology is. The technology works by concentrating sunlight on a single point. Liquid there is heated to extreme temperatures, almost 600 degrees Celsius, creating supercritical steam. That drives a turbine at high speed and high pressure to create power. The steam and turbine part of the technology isn't new. It's the use of the sun's energy to create the steam to power it that is. Something like 90% of the world's electricity comes from making that hot fluid today and then expanding it through some sort of turbine. All we are doing here is changing the front end and having concentrated sun to make that, that hot fluid, replacing the normal heat production which normally comes from coal or gas or biomass or even nuclear. 
The potential is enormous. It wouldn't take huge areas of sun-baked land to create big quantities of power. This is just a prototype, but the hope is that in years to come there could be fields of solar mirrors in deserts all over the world. One just 50 kilometres by 50 kilometres could provide enough electricity for a quarter of all Australia's needs. At the moment, the technology is very expensive and recent falls in the price of fossil fuels don't help make innovative green solutions competitive. But in the long term, this technology could represent the best chance for solar to play a big role in electricity production. Andrew Thomas, Al Jazeera, Newcastle, Australia. Just a reminder now that you can always keep up to date with all the news on our website at aljazeera.com. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Peranum with the headlines on Al Jazeera. Polls will open in under an hour in Sudan's general elections, but it's being boycotted by many opposition parties because they don't believe the vote will be free and fair. Omar al-Bashir has ruled the country for 26 years. He's the favourite to win the presidential race. Hillary Clinton has launched her bid to become the United States' first female president. The former U.S. Secretary of State is expected to begin campaigning in the state of Iowa on Tuesday. Saudi Arabia has rejected Iran's demands to stop bombing Yemen. The Saudi Foreign Minister, Prince Saud al-Faisal, has accused Tehran of fueling the cycle of violence. And there have been more airstrikes and fighting in northern Yemen. At least 14 people have been killed in two separate attacks in Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. In one of the attacks, a suicide bomber detonated his vehicle at the entrance to a large police station in the provincial capital, El Arish. At least six people were killed, including five policemen. Rescue workers are searching through the rubble and the death toll is expected to rise. In Syria, a government airstrike has reportedly killed five children and four teachers at a school in the northern city of Aleppo. Activists say the air raid hit the opposition-held Ansari neighbourhood. Two embassies have been attacked in the Libyan capital Tripoli. A bomb exploded at the gate of the Moroccan embassy and in an earlier attack, a gunman killed two security officers outside the South Korean embassy. Shots were fired from a car at the compound in Tripoli. Fighters lawyer to ISIL say they're behind the attack. There have been violent protests in Gabon on the west coast of Central Africa following the death of a senior opposition leader. Witnesses say opposition supporters set fire to the embassy of Benin while rioting in the streets of the capital. They accused the government of poisoning Andre Maba Obame, who died on Sunday. He was 57 years old and ran for the presidency in 2009. Hundreds of thousands of Brazilians have taken to the streets to protest. They're angry about the struggling economy and a corruption scandal that has implicated politicians from President Dilma Rousseff's party. Those are the headlines on Al Jazeera, but do stay with us. Listening Post is up next. The stream has a whole new look and with you our vibrant online community it's never been easier to get involved. The problem in Syria is a humanitarian crisis. Last year alone, 76,000 civilians were killed. So we're repeating the same mistake that the US has done when going to Iraq and Afghanistan. Become a part of it. The stream at this time on Al Jazeera. What you're seeing in Bangladesh is a growing intolerance. A machete-wielding mob has hacked to death a blogger in the Bangladeshi capital, Dhaka. Why are bloggers under attack there? Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're tracking this week. Bangladesh, where blogging about religion can get you killed and reporting on the government can get you arrested. The newspaper business and the advertisers who are going native. It's a new revenue stream, but it comes with questions attached. Some former hostages in France sue a news channel for making their situation worse, more dangerous. And recognize this fellow? And I want to offer you a large sum of money. You should. He has your email address. Last week, we reported on the story of two bloggers murdered in Bangladesh. This week, we're going to dig a little deeper into the context in which those killings took place. In February, a Bangladeshi-American blogger, Avijit Roy, the founder of a secularist website, was hacked to death in a Dhaka street. 
Just a few days later, another blogger, Washakur Rahman, met the same fate. Both men were killed for airing critical views on religion. The social media space in Bangladesh is a polarized place. On one side are secular bloggers who want to prevent religion seeping further into politics. On the other, voices that associate themselves with political Islam, pushing for blasphemy laws to protect their religion. As for the context, the roots of this story go all the way back to 1971, Bangladesh's war of independence with Pakistan, and a legal case that is yet to be resolved. One of the key figures accused of genocide back then is Mohammed Kamar Uzaman, a member of the opposition Jamaat e Islami Party. This week, he lost his appeal in court and is facing the death penalty, handed down by a war crimes tribunal that Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina set up in 2010 to investigate what happened in 1971. Opposition parties say the war crimes trials are politically motivated and have more to do with settling scores than dispensing justice. The social media debate about the trials began online and has since spilled out onto the streets. On the mainstream media side, journalists questioning the government's version of this story are finding themselves in court as well. Our starting point this week is the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka. The killings have sent shockwaves through Bangladesh. Two brutal murders in the space of about one month. For many years, we've prided ourselves on the fact that extremism has been kept under control. Maybe this is now the tip of the iceberg of something new. And certainly, especially in the media, we're even more concerned because those of us in the media, we provide our opinion, we speak constantly. So if people are going to be targeted for their words, media has more to worry about than just about anyone else. The essay by the Bangladeshi American blogger was posted on the website of an American group called the Council of Secular Humanism. He wrote, the death threats started flowing to my email box. A well-known extremist by the name of Farabi Shafur Rahman openly issued death threats through Facebook. Rahman wrote, Avijit Roy lives in America, so it is not possible to kill him right now, but he will be murdered when he comes back. The essay concludes with the writer's biography and the news that the threats were to be taken seriously. And a few days after Roy was killed, he was followed to the grave by Washakur Rahman. Neither of the bloggers were speaking out against religion. They were talking about religious extremism and how some Bangladeshis misinterpret religion. Both of them wrote against fanaticism and accused some of benefiting economically from business presented under the banner of religion. But they never said anything which could have hurt religious sentiments. Obhijit Roy, uh, he was not actually uh, writing, uh, criticizing uh, only Islam. He was uh, sometimes criticizes all the uh, religions like Islam, Hindu, Christianity, or Buddhist, all these cases. But in Oshikur Rahman, uh, he was not that prominent blogger. And in the cases, uh, he sometimes criticizes extremism of Islam, especially uh, radical groups of uh, Islam. The message which has been sent is if someone like Washikur can be no one is beyond the notice of the militants. Bangladesh historically is a very tolerant country, religious point of view and other point of view. But we are uh, experiencing that there are some kind of ultra attitude from the religious parties and at the same time ultra attitude from the secular parties. Previously there were no conflict regarding this situation. Why these uh, issues are now coming up? Freedom of expression in Bangladesh has grown into an issue over some unfinished business from 1971. Recent history that still lingers and divides. Bangladeshis call it the liberation war against Pakistan, and the sheer scale of suffering is difficult to grasp. The authorities in Dhaka say three million were killed, another 30 million displaced. It was considered one of the five worst cases of genocide of the 20th century. And there was genocidal rape, as many as 400,000 victims. Five years ago, Prime Minister Hasina and her Awami League government set up the ICT, the International Crimes Tribunal, to investigate war crimes. Among the first indicted were nine leaders from Jamaat-e-Islami, a religious party. Their supporters protested that the trials were political. 
and there were protests from the other side when some of those convicted were spared the death penalty. With the wounds of 1971 reopened, the debate over what happened reignited online and in the mainstream media. In the cases of uh, war crimes and uh, in the cases of issues of independence or uh, war of independence, this is very sensitive uh, here uh, because we have fought and uh, we have lost our three million people. So in these cases, if anybody raise any question uh, regarding the numbers of uh, our martyrs, then uh, that actually very much emotional to this nation because we have lost this and uh, we are still fighting for the justice of this killing. We are holding war crimes trials and this is something which is long overdue and necessary for Bangladesh to move on is a nation. But what we're seeing now is that if anyone is critical of the war crimes trials procedure or there are certain issues about uh, the, our liberation war in 1971 which if people question, that space for questioning has completely shrunk. Only a small portion. This war of words starts with a number. Three million. The first person to put the death toll that high was Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Bangladesh's independence leader. He said it to the British interviewer David Frost in 1972. That figure was never verified and is often questioned. David Bergman is a British journalist based in Dhaka who writes a blog on the war crimes tribunal. When he wrote that the evidence suggests that far fewer than three million died, the ICT charged him with contempt of court. Then, when a group of activists and academics wrote a letter supporting Bergman's right to express his doubts, 23 of them were also charged with contempt. The court has been adamant regarding this issue. In the Liberation War 1971, 3 million people sacrificed their life, 300,000 women were raped. It is true that it is not good to question the death toll because it is officially authorized by the government. But the problem is that if anyone talks about it, it is considered as the contempt of court. This is not freedom of expression. In our constitution, there is nothing written saying that the 1971 death toll can be discussed or questioned. However, the unwritten rules seem to say something different for bloggers and also for mainstream news outlets. In 2013, the Hasina government shut down two channels, Deganta TV and Islamic TV, for allegedly airing misleading information. This year, it blocked out a channel called ETV and charged the owner with sedition. And two months ago, another channel, Banglavision, suddenly dropped a political talk show called Frontline. The channel blamed technical reasons, but no one, given everything that's happening in the Bangladeshi media space, really believes that. Our uh, red lines are very harsh nowadays. So previously, journalists can write many things, but nowadays, a lot of government rules, government restrictions, categorically uh, imposing bans. The media is being heavily censored, and you can express only one view. That's the problem here. On the download this week, our viewers on the mainstream and social media sides of the story in Bangladesh. We have seen in the past that certain newspapers incited violence against the bloggers. Yes, there have been some instances of contempt of court, but the International Crimes Tribunal has warned, reprimanded, and even fined journalists and editors. I would hesitate to put these contempt of court issues at the same level as the life threats the bloggers are faced with on an everyday basis. In Bangladesh, if we talk about the Islamic educational system, Islamist people will declare us as apostates. Many of Bangladeshi Muslims think it's okay to kill atheist bloggers. And then the government is also remaining silent. 
Other media stories on our radar this week. A group of hostages held during the recent attack at a Jewish supermarket in Paris are suing a French news broadcaster over its coverage of the siege, alleging that the news channel put them at greater risk. The hostage taking took place three months ago and coincided with the shootings at Charlie Hebdo. A gunman, Amadi Koulibaly, held a group at a kosher supermarket in East Paris. Four people were killed. French broadcaster BFM was one of many channels reporting the story live and revealed that several of the hostages were hiding in a refrigerated storeroom. The lawyer for those hostages, Patrick Klugman, says that lives could have been at risk if Koulibaly had been aware in real time of what BFM was broadcasting. And Koulibaly had been in contact with BFM, so the channel should have known he could have been watching. BFM has issued a statement which amounts to a guilty plea with an explanation, saying the information was broadcast only once. Immediately, the chief editor felt that this information should not be released, the channel said. It was therefore never repeated on air or posted on screen. BFM TV regrets that the mention of this information could cause concern to the hostages as well as their relatives that their lives were in danger. Judith Miller, the former New York Times reporter, disgraced by her work.